Hello, Insta family. It is Dr. T here, and I would like to introduce the artwork that is sitting above my head, painted by one young Sophie Simpson. <laughs> it is beautiful. I love looking at that. It makes me smile every time I do. Uh, so we are here on a Wednesday night for our live Q&A. I hope you're doing well. It's a stinky hot Perth afternoon. And I've got to tell you, when it rains, it pours. I said to everybody last week, feel free to direct message me your questions for Q&A, and I have been showered with them. <laughs> so I've got about half a dozen here that I'm going to get through, but don't forget, you can drop your questions into the comments section. Again, just a few guidelines. Try and make them as generic as possible. I don't need your life story. I will be giving you as generic an answer as I can so that the answer is applicable to anyone else out there who might be wanting to know the same thing. Um, that's pretty much it. So a couple of things. Um, yeah. When direct messaging me, please ensure that uh, I will please understand that I won't be addressing clinical questions via direct message. So I don't think that's an appropriate place to do medicine. So feel free to send me your questions, come and have an appointment even, uh, but we will be discussing general stuff in our Q&A. So I'm sure all of you out there respect that. You want to, when you do medicine, you want to do the right thing by your patient. All right, let me start with a few questions while I'm waiting for some stuff to come through on the comments. Somebody asked the question, I'm currently breastfeeding we, and I have done an ovulation testing kit that shows that I'm ovulatory. Will weaning my baby increase the chances of me falling pregnant? Great question. So when you are breastfeeding, you are producing hormones that in an evolutionary way aim to suppress the menstrual cycle. Amazing, really, that um, while you're still feeding a child, your body goes, maybe it's not the right time to be investing your energy into creating a new child. Kind of makes sense from a, an evolutionary point of view. So... Uh, some women, when they start to reduce the number of feeds they do, perhaps they knock out the night feed. Some women will start to ovulate even when they are breastfeeding. So their periods will return. Doesn't mean that the periods are necessarily going to be, or sorry, the menstrual cycles are going to be normal. You can have some disordered ovulation, even though it appears that you are getting a normal menstrual cycle back. There is some research that is being done on the East Coast looking at can you do an embryo transfer whilst breastfeeding in the context of a frozen embryo transfer, and it seems to suggest that you can. However, if we're talking about spontaneous ovulation, I guess my advice would be this. If you are trying to conceive while still breastfeeding another child and you are not successful, then the first thing that you should consider doing is probably weaning because one of the possible causes of why you don't conceive when you're breastfeeding is disordered ovulation. It doesn't mean, it's not black or white. It doesn't mean that just because you've had a return of cycle uh, sorry, it doesn't mean that just because you're breastfeeding, your cycle won't return, but it also doesn't mean that if your cycle has returned, you can necessarily conceive if there is some uh, disorder there. So by all means, go for it. But if you're finding that you're not conceiving despite timing intercourse around ovulation, it would probably be the first thing that as a fertility specialist, I would suggest you do is wean your child. Hopefully that's helpful. Okay. Misdiagnosis of PCOS on the combined oral contraceptive pill. Can it happen? Well, absolutely it can happen. And the reason for that is that the point of being on the pill for the management of polycystic ovarian syndrome is, number one, it will regulate your cycle because you're technically not ovulating on the pill. You are having a programmed withdrawal bleed. So the idea of irregular periods disappears. And that's one of the diagnostic criteria, criteria for PCOS. 
Number two, because it increases the carrier protein called SHBG, your androgen levels or male hormone levels will drop. And so those androgenic features, acne, um, will decrease. So again, and on your blood tests, your free androgens may decrease as well. Yet another diagnostic criteria for PCOS. So uh, my suggestion would be that if you would like to confirm whether or not you have PCOS, is that you come off the pill for approximately three months, which will then allow the sort of um, biochemical features of PCOS to manifest themselves and for cycle irregularity to manifest itself as well. The other thing too, going on the pill and being having no cycles, it will suppress the ovaries and they may not have that big bulky appearance, particularly the longer that you're on the pill, uh, that you see on ultrasound when uh, looking for PCO morphology. So again, there's criteria number three. So yes, you can completely be misdiagnosed as not having PCOS if you are on the pill. What are your options for treatment of polycystic ovarian syndrome, just very quickly, uh, the mainstay of treatment if you have open tubes and the sperm and that semen analysis is normal, the mainstay of treatment is ovulation induction, that is how you treat disordered ovulation. Some people will progress to IVF, it is perfectly reasonable, particularly in the context of other fertility issues. However, there is a much higher risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Okay, next question. I haven't seen anything drop into the comments just now, so I'm assuming you guys are just happy to keep listening, but remember you can drop your questions into the comments if you like. I recently put up a post on multiple pregnancies and double embryo transfer. I just want to qualify a few things because I have had a couple of questions about that. Can you request a double embryo transfer? Absolutely, you can request it, but it is definitely important that the clinician discuss with you the pros and cons of a double embryo transfer. In Australia, our objective, our mainstay of treatment is single embryo transfer because we don't want you to have multiple pregnancy and there are reasons for that. The number one being the, inc the higher incidence of pregnancy complications including gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, preterm birth, cesarean delivery, babies in the nursery, cerebral palsy rates, do I need to go on? <laughs> in addition to that, I think it's really important that people understand what are we doing a double embryo transfer for? The, it is not to give you a twin pregnancy, I can promise you that. <laughs> that is not our objective as fertility practitioners. Sounds romantic, complication rate too high, and our motto is first do no harm. So, the purpose of a double embryo transfer is to marginally increase your chance of conceiving or your pregnancy rate. So yes, doing a double embryo transfer will increase in that transfer your chance or your a higher chance of pregnancy. However, it will also increase your chance of miscarrying that pregnancy and it will also increase your chance of multiple pregnancy. Here's the thing. If you looked at an IVF cycle and the transfers of embryos fresh and also subsequent frozen embryo transfers from that IVF cycle, the pregnancy rates cumulatively over any number of cycles is the same. So although in one transfer your pregnancy rate may be increased, your cumulative pregnancy rate is not increased by doing a double embryo transfer. However, your multiple pregnancy rate is increased and your miscarriage rates are increased. So I think it's really important to consider the individual clinical scenario that you're dealing with and you know, discuss the pros and cons with your fertility specialist about a double embryo transfer. Hopefully that clarifies it a little bit. Now, somebody else has asked about the microbiome. How can I test the vaginal microbiome? A swab, a vaginal swab will do the trick um, I recommend um, considering seeing a naturopath who is skilled in identification of the microbiome and or treatment of such. Can the vaginal microbiome represent the uterine bi bi microbiome? At present, our understanding is they are two completely different microenvironments. 
and they vary throughout the menstrual cycle. So at the beginning of your menstrual cycle, your uterine microbiome is probably gonna be very different to the end. Can you sample the uterine microbiome? Yes, you can do that um, with a genomic test. Um, quite difficult, quite costly, and we really don't know or understand how to interpret that data depending on where you are in your menstrual cycle. We think we understand which bacteria we want there. We want the uh, Lactobacillus crispatus, but there are many studies out there that look at different concentrations, different lactobacilli predominance, its presence in the context of pathogenic, and also which population of people we care about. Do we care about the recurrent implantation, the recurrent miscarriage, the infertile, those with endometriosis, those with PCOS? Like this is such an evidence-free space at this point in time. Whilst we can give you, I guess, a measure of the vaginal and or the uterine microbiome, we don't know from a treatment perspective what to do with that information. So generally speaking, would I suggest improving microbiome? Absolutely. Do I know how best to improve it? Do you take an oral probiotic? Do you need a vaginal probiotic? How do you get probiotics from the gastrointestinal tract across to the uterine? Pretty evidence-free space at this point in time. So I think this is a pioneering area of fertility research, and I certainly will be watching this space over time. So I know that's not particularly helpful, but honestly, I don't think the evidence is really solid in this space enough for us to be pres prescriptive. Uh, in that context, Karen has asked, what are your thoughts on era and implantation failure? I think it has gone out of fashion. I think that perhaps the assessment of the trio, so the Emma looking at the microbiome and also the Alice looking at chronic endometritis may have some future clinical significance. I know there is some rather elegant research that has been published showing that moving your transfer in the context of a non-receptive endometrium on an era test actually is quite harmful for pregnancy rates. So I personally don't order the test anymore, nor do I recommend moving a transfer based on the test outcome. Uh, so I think ERA is probably going out of fashion as a form of assessment of the endometrial receptivity. Is there another test in its place? I haven't seen great evidence yet, but again, this has got to be about individualized medicine. There may be some people who benefit from um, consideration of endometrial receptivity testing, but certainly the jury at this point is out, in my mind. Uh, what else? Was there another question? Mrs. English lady, lovely to see you. Can you find out the sex of your embryo in IVF? If not, why when you can in other countries? Uh, because it's illegal. We do not allow the transfer of embryos for sex selection for family balancing. The only time you can find out the gender of, uh, or sorry, the sex rather, of an embryo is if we're looking at sex selection for sex-linked disorders. So that's the only time you can selectively choose, probably a female to be honest, because you'd be selecting out the males. Uh, if there is a sex-linked genetic condition, um, so PGTM is being performed, but just purely for family balancing, it is illegal. And that is the reason why. There is no other reason other than it is illegal. Okay, <laughs> any other questions? None there. I have one other question, which I must say, I'm probably not the expert at this, but I'll certainly go and do some research and I will do a post on this. And that is vaginal moisturizers that is family friendly. I'm not gonna comment about any particular brand. <laughs> I certainly know some of my friends are aligned with some brands, um, but I'm not sure about the evidence that a lubricant or vaginal moisturizer, depends on how you define them, is going to increase your pregnancy rates 
if there's not a problem with your vaginal environment. So if the sperm is normal, if the tubes are open, if there is no identifiable pathology, do I think it's reasonable to consider trying a vaginal moisturiser or a lubricant to increase spontaneous pregnancy rates? Sure. Would I necessarily suggest you go down that pathway if you're 42, 43 years of age? No, <laughs> I would not because I think that it's taking you off track. Um, do I think it would be valuable to utilise these things if you are young, if you have unexplained infertility? I'm sure you can give it a try, but I wouldn't languish there for months and months on end. Um, so do I know the in-depth research on this stuff? I don't really have a great handle on it. I certainly will make it my... I will certainly endeavour to go and do some research on this area and look to see if there is any evidence in this stuff. Um, sounds interesting, doesn't it? Wouldn't it be nice to know that there is a lubricant or a vaginal moisturiser that's going to increase your chances of getting pregnant? Can't see how, but uh, let me do some research in that space and come back to you with my thoughts on that. All right. Are there any more questions? Haven't seen anything come through. I'm really hoping that this was all valuable for you. Uh, thank you for dropping questions. If you have any others that you come up with or you know of anybody that has questions, don't forget to DM me. Please don't DM me your clinical history and uh, I won't be answering clinical questions on direct, but I'm very happy to address anything in next week's Q&A. Great questions. Keep them coming through. I hope to everyone else that listened in, there was valuable information and I will see you next week. Bye.